So welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Alana Heckler and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the first episode of the Dermatology Webinar Series hosted by the Euroimmune Academy. We are excited to present today's topic, Clinical and Laboratory Diagnostics of Nail Fungal Disease, Old versus New Techniques. This webinar is divided into three parts. First, Dr. Rich will speak about the clinical presentation of dermatomycosis. Next, Dr. Thompson will address the key technologies used for the detection of nail fungal diseases. And finally, Dr. El Hajj will highlight the importance of species specific treatment in fungal infections. Following the presentations, we will open the webinar up for a panel discussion. If you have any questions for our speakers, please type them in the chat box on your screen and we will relay them to the speakers during the Q&A session. If you are interested in obtaining paced contact hours for this webinar, it is important that you log on individually and stay for the entire duration of the webinar because this will be counted as your attendance. After the webinar, you'll receive instructions on how to claim your PACE certificate. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our first speaker, Dr. Phoebe Rich. Dr. Rich is a dermatologist from Portland, Oregon, and has been practicing for 28 years. She is also a clinical adjunct professor of dermatology at Oregon Health and Science University, where she focuses on nail diseases and disorders, nail biology, and the medical and surgical management of nail conditions. Dr. Rich is recognized nationally and internationally for her knowledge on the topics of onchiomycosis and other skin conditions, and has been the principal investigator for over 400 clinical studies. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Rich for her presentation. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction. Uh, good morning, and I'm pleased to be here. I'm Phoebe Rich from Portland, Oregon, and my special interest in dermatology is nail disorders, so I'm delighted to talk to you about one of my favorite topics, onychomycosis. So let's get started. What are our objectives for this morning? Um, well, we'd like to answer a number of questions. First of all, why treat nail fungus? You know, a lot of people say, oh, it's just toenails, oh, it's just cosmetic. But I'd like to show you some examples of real patients who, in my practice actually, who um, who believe that excuse me, onychomycosis is far more than just cosmetic. Uh, we'll also talk about epidemiology, who gets onychomycosis um, and what patient populations might be at more risk with onychomycosis. We'll talk um, a little bit about the types and patterns of onychomycosis. And um, you, you all probably know this already, but um, I think it is important to reiterate because um, knowing which type you're dealing with and where the fungus elements are within the nail unit helps us um, collect specimens, for example, and also treat our patients better. Um, onychomycosis lookalikes, 50% of the nail problems that come into a, a medical office are fungal and 50% are something other than fungus. And so we always want to be sure we're treating the right 50%, so 50% that are fungus. So excuse me, we'll talk about some lookalikes and things that people can confuse uh, for onychomycosis. Um, and then finally, um, confirming your clinical diagnosis. Once you think you know what you're dealing with, we want to confirm it um, with laboratory. So we'll talk more about that too. Okay, so, so our goal in dealing with onychomycosis, well, our, our overwhelming goal is that we want to help patients more than uh, as much as we very, very much can. Um, but our, our goal is perfect diagnosis. Um, and to do that, we need, uh, we want an accurate diagnosis of onychomycosis and we need a clinical diagnosis. So we have to be on the right page in terms of our patients. And then also we need diagnostic confirmation. And we're going to look at these, these separately. Um, so um, I, I'd like to say onychomycosis is far more than just a cosmetic. And I'm going to show you some um, examples from my practice of patients, real patients, who, for whom onychomycosis is far more than just cosmetic. Um, this first, first one is a new mom. She came in. She was terrified that she was going to give her nail fungus to her baby. She didn't want to bathe the baby. She didn't want to hold the baby without gloves. She was, she was very frightened. So, so clearing her onychomycosis changed her quality of life amazingly, and it also made her more comfortable with being a new mother. So for her, this is far more than just cosmetic. 
This uh, 60-year-old woman is a seamstress. She she sews for a career, but also likes to make quilts and various things uh, with pins and needles. And when her nails are like this with onychomycosis, she cannot pick up pins and needles um, uh, with her fungal nails. So for her, this is far more than just a cosmetic problem. Uh, this is a 23-year-old um, college student who wants to be a ballet dancer. That is her goal in life. And when her nail is like this, she cannot do toe dancing. She cannot, she cannot dance. So for her, this is far more than just cosmetic. It may seem cosmetic, but for her, it is more than just cosmetic. Um, and this is a high school teacher concerned that students will ridicule him for his fungal nails uh, so for him, his self-esteem and his self-image are important, and this is far more than just cosmetic to him. So onychomycosis can spread to other sites. Um, it can be a portal of infection for bacterial um, uh, infections and also can lead to more severe problems such as cellulitis and gang gangrene in, in uh, high-risk populations. And there are some high-risk populations, people who are more at risk with onychomycosis of developing bad side effects. Um, it's a significant health risk in, in diabetics. That's one of the patient populations. Also immunocompromised patients, uh, cancer chemotherapy, transplant patients also are at increased risk of developing um, secondary bacterial infections, including cellulitis and phlebitis. Um, uh, in, uh, concomitant with their onychomycosis. Um, undetected foot trauma from sharp fungal nails can lead to limb-threatening infections, actually, um, amputation, and also other uh, serious infections in diabetics who have neuropathy. In other words, they don't feel the, the pain of uh, the cuts and breaks in their skin from their onychomycosis. Um, untreated interdigital tinea pedis can be a huge problem for diabetics who, again, don't feel the pain, they have neuropathy, they, they, they don't um, feel that there's something going on. And so often infections go untreated and undetected for long periods of time. Um, diabetics have a higher risk of secondary bacterial infection, as we said, um, cellulitis and phlebitis from thickened, sharp nails. Um, and, and those with, um, with tinea can also have, especially the um, interdigital tinea can have are at higher risk of gangrene and ulcers and, and even amputations. Um, diabetics have um, a higher risk, uh, diabetics with onychomycosis have a higher risk of 4.7% of gangrene versus 1% of risk with patients without onychomycosis. So um, yeah, it, it, it's a real, it can be a real threat. So we talked about um, who gets it. Now, what are some of the patterns of and types of onychomycosis? Um, well, basically there are, um, Five types, distal, lateral, subungal onychomycosis. This makes up about 90% of the onychomycosis that we see. This, this is garden variety, toenail fungus. Um, I'm going to show you some pictures in a minute. Proximal subungal onychomycosis um, is much less common, although we do see it. Um, and, and that's a very characteristic thing. And that's important to, to recognize and to understand because you need to know where to take the specimen from when you're going to submit it for confirmation of your clinical diagnosis. Uh, white superficial um, is on the surface. That's one of the few onychomycosis um, uh, subtypes that we can treat topically because it is a surface uh, surface uh, infection. Total dystrophic is basically onychomycosis everywhere. And then Canada onychomycosis, which is a mixed bag. And I'll show you that too. So um, this is just um, an, uh, basically a scheme of um, a photo of a nail uh, with the parts located. The nail unit consists of the hyponychium, the proximal nail and lateral nail fold, and the, uh, the matrix. The matrix is the lunula uh, back by the cuticle. And I'm going to superimpose the types of onychomycosis on top of this drawing so you can see where the organisms gain access to the nail unit. Um, so starting with the, on the left with lateral distal subungal onychomycosis, um, that um, it, just what it sounds like, it starts distally and laterally and goes under the nail. So it, <clears throat> excuse me, it, it um, starts at the hyponychium and travels backward in the nail bed in the longitudinal grooves of the nail bed. Um, and so it's, um, uh, the active part of it is actually the most proximal part of the visual onychomycosis. 
Uh, moving on to the upper left, white superficial onychomycosis is on the surface. Some people call it superficial white, white superficial, either way. Um, it's on the surface of the nail plate, a white chalky looking um, um, discoloration. And the organisms are right where you see the white. So if you're going to confirm the diagnosis with, um, uh, with laboratory, you need to take the specimen from that area. Proximal subungual onychomycosis, PSO, um, is a proximal, that's the yellow on the right side, um, gains access to the nail unit under the cuticle. So that's, um, and then it moves, it moves from proximal to distal under the nail plate. Um, the total dystrophic is really everywhere. So that can be, that, that's basically the whole nail is involved. In Canada, onychomycosis is, um, as you'll see in a minute, is, um, is kind of a mixed bag and we'll, we'll go through that too. Okay, so distal lateral subungual onychomycosis starts distally at the free edge of the nail and travels backward. And you can kind of see it tracking back a little bit. This is also distal lateral subungual onychomycosis. Do you see how, do you see how it kind of tracks back through the longitudinal grooves in the nail bed that are involved in attachment and of nail plate to nail bed? Um, and so, and that's very characteristic. And when you take a specimen here, you want to get the nail bed uh, crumbly um, hyperkeratosis as part of your specimen because that really is where the money is in terms of getting a good diagnosis. Um, also, clipping clipping the nail plate is is important too because that will expose more of the crumbly, and you can you can get more of that. Uh, white superficial onychomycosis is a superficial layer of fungus on the surface. Um, and of course, you need to sample that white area when you are taking your specimen. Uh, proximal subungal starts proximally and then um, over time uh, migrates distally in the nail. So you need to um, obviously take the specimen back there, which sometimes can be tricky, but usually um, the nail plate becomes thick enough, uh, the, the fungus becomes thick enough that you can, you can sample it uh, without uh, doing too much uh, damage to the nail unit. And then total dystrophic, just the whole thing is gone, basically. The, you know, the proximal, the distal, the uh, superficial, everything, you know, it's, it's basically total, just like it sounds, total dystrophic onychomycosis. Canada onychom, true Canada onychomycosis um, occurs in a condition, it's, it's very true, it's very rare, uh, in a condition called chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis, which is a uh, genetically inherited disorder with immune dysfunction, which allows candida to actually invade the nail plate. Normally, candida is not a good nail plate invader. It doesn't have the enzymes to, um, to utilize the keratin like dermatophytes. Um, but we do see it frequently as a secondary infection in conditions like onycholysis and chronic paronychia, in which the, um, the barrier around the nail is, is disrupted. So there's lifting. If the, if the hyponychium is, lift, is disrupted, there's lifting called onycholysis. Um, and if the cuticle is gone, the uh, candida can migrate under the nail fold and cause a lot of inflammation and um, you know, erythema, uh, uh, redness, swelling, puffiness, all of that. Um, and so, um, although they're not, although Canada is not the primary cause in these situations, it is definitely there often. And if it's, and it can keep, it can perpetuate the situation and keep it going. So, clearing the Canada in these in these um, other uh, conditions actually helps heal the process, even though Canada may not be the initial cause. Um, dermatophytoma is something that you'll hear a lot in onychomycosis because um, they're they're difficult to treat. It's it's thought to be the, it's this this yellowy kind of spike thing in the middle of the nail here. It's thought to be a pure culture of dermatophytes, so a much harder to treat, much harder for the drugs to penetrate. Dermatophytoma. So we talked about clinical diagnosis and the patterns of onychomycosis. Um, as I said earlier, 50% of the nail problems that, that walk into a medical office um, are, um, are, excuse, excuse me a second, are um, onychomycosis and 50% are something entirely different. Um, and it's important to know that there are lots of things that mimic onychomycosis and can look just like onychomycosis. So you really can't just go on the clinical you need laboratory confirmation once you make your clinical diagnosis. And it's important to, to be aware of all these other 
uh, conditions because um, if you're not thinking about them, you just may assume it's all fungal. So let's let's look at some of these uh, things in the differential diagnosis of onychomycosis. Um, as we said, 50% are not fungus, 50% are something else, 50% are fungus. Okay. And, and the mimics are the ones that we have to um, sort out so that we can have a, um, a correct diagnosis and a successful outcome. The most common ones are psoriasis, lichen planus, um, other kinds of infections, um, and, and really a whole host of other more rare things, congenital things, um, nail conditions associated with systemic disease. And I'll, I'll just go through a few of these. So the question is, is this onychomycosis? It looks like onychomycosis. It's got toenail stuff. It's got onycholysis. It's got um, some, some surface dystrophy. It has um, lots of things. It has splinter hemorrhages. Is this onychomycosis? This is not onychomycosis. What do you think this might be? Well, this is nail psoriasis. Nail psoriasis has many features of onychomycosis, um, and it's important to be aware that uh, of the fact that um, not everybody with nail psoriasis has cutaneous psoriasis. In fact, about 5% of patients with nail psoriasis have it only in the nail, so it's limited to the nails, at least at the time of of presentation or diagnosis. Now, often those patients will go on later on to have nail psoriasis, but early on they have no skin findings at all, just nail, just psoriasis in their nails. So, um, so that can be a little bit tricky. Now, in a patient like this, is this onychomycosis? No, this is nail psoriasis too. But in a patient like this, it's a little bit easier because they do have the plaques of psoriasis, and that gives you a very good clue. But as I said. 5% of patients do not have any skin psoriasis when they have nail psoriasis. It's also important to know that a, that a percentage, and the, and the data is about 20 to 30% of patients have, um, uh, can have some fungus secondarily invading um, nail psoriasis. So there may be a combination going on, but you definitely want to be sure you know that the patient has nail psoriasis so that you don't continue to treat. Some of these patients are treated for decades because it looks like fungus in it when it is in fact psoriasis. Um, is this onychomycosis? No, again, it looks like onychomycosis. Look, there's yellow, it's, it's, the surface is irregular, there's lifting. This is also nail psoriasis. So keep a high index of suspicion. This patient does not have psoriasis anywhere else and does not have onychomycosis anywhere else. Um, but this is not onychomycosis, this is psoriasis. Okay. Um, is this onychomycosis? What do you think? Eh, kind of looks fungal. What do you think? Anybody know what this is? Um, well, this is not onychomycosis either. This is lichen planus of the nails. And lichen planus has two forms. It has onychorexis on the right, where it has longitudinal ridges. And this is the type that can turn into, can eventuate into pterygium with permanent scarring of the nail. Um, the the uh, figure on the left is a different patient, actually, um, who has um, more of an onychal, um, a tracheonychia uh, variant of lichen planus. And this, this is less of a, uh, a nail emergency because it doesn't tend to scar, but you still want to sort it out from onychomycosis because this will like it better with antifungals and you need to, you need to be aware of that. Is this onychomycosis? Well, boy, that sure looks like onychomycosis. This patient actually has something called congenital malalignment of the great toenail, which um, he has had since birth. Um, both toenails are, are deviated laterally um, and they have a short nail bed. So they get what's called a ram's horn deformity or onychogryphosis. So not onychomycosis. Um, uh, you may think that there's onychomycosis here, but when you sample it, it is just thickened nail keratin, not onychomycosis. Um, and uh, one or two more, this woman um, has had uh, um, this defect all of her life. Her nail beds are very, very short. Can you see how she has brachionychia? This is not onychomycosis. She's been treated for a very long time with antifungals. It doesn't get better. The reason it doesn't get better is because it's not fungal. It's not a fungal condition. Okay. Brachionychia. Um, is this onychomycosis? Nails are yellow. Nails are lifted. What do you think? Onychomycosis? Who knows what this is? This is a very, a very interesting condition actually. And not very common, but I do see I do see it in my clinic because I only see nail problems in my my practice. Um, so this is called yellow nail syndrome, and it's characterized by yellow, slow growing nails with absent lunula and cuticle, um, and it's associated with 
pulmonary problems, lung issues, actually. So bronchiectasis, pleural effusion, and also another feature of patients with yellow nail syndrome is uh, lymphedema. So yellow nail syndrome, not a fungus. Um, onychomycosis, is this onychomycosis? No, this is another genodermatosis called Pachyonychia congenita. Um, and these, these children are born with abnormal nails. They can lick, look, get thick, they can look funny, but this is not fungal. In fact, fungus doesn't infect these nails. Okay, so our goal is perfect diagnosis. And so far we've talked about clinical diagnosis, the patterns of onychomycosis, and we've talked about the fact that not everything in the nails is, fun is fungal and there is a good differential diagnosis that we have to be aware of. So um, the, next top, the next part of the deal is confirmation. So once you have your clinical diagnosis and you know it's not something other than fungus or you have a good hunch, you need to, you need to confirm it and, you, and you, we, have, we have tests that do that. So you need to know the organisms and you need to know the, the diagnostic tests. So onychomycosis is caused by dermatophytes primarily, but also yeasts and non-dermatophyte molds. When it's, when it's a dermatophyte, technically it, it's onychomycosis too, but it's tinea unguium. Um, uh, yeast and molds and dermatophytes are all collectively called onychomycosis. So dermatophytes are causative in 90% of toenails and 75% of fingernail onychomycosis worldwide. Um, and, and really the, the percentages of, um, of organisms vary widely worldwide, um, especially in tropical climates. It's very different than cold climates and um, so th there's a lot of variability in the organisms that are seen around the world. Um, the most common dermatophytes that we see are trichophyte and rubrum and trichophyte and um, T. rubrum by, is by far and away the most common. Um, about 20, about 10 um, or more uncommon dermatophytes are seen um, in some parts of the world. Um, yeast and non-dermatophyte molds are, are not nearly as as common as dermatophytes, but they do occur in, um, in a variety of um, uh, onychomycosis situations. Again, more in different climates than in North America, um, um, but, but there is a variability there. So um, in, in our neck of the woods, in, in Western countries, dermatophytes uh, cause 50 to 72% of cases of onychomycosis, and yeast account for up to 19%. Non-dermatophyte molds account, uh, account for up to 10%. And if you look at the numbers here, um, you can see there's some uh, kind of uh, variability. It doesn't add up to 100%. And that's because you can also have mixed infections of dermatophytes plus yeast or dermatophytes plus non-dermatophyte molds. So, um, so you need to be aware of that as well. Um, uh, Dr. Gupta um, in Canada has done the most, uh, has done an incredible amount of work um, sorting all this out, and uh, he's, he's definitely a, a brilliant dermatologist who has dedicated his career to um, to fungal infection. So um, he he needs a, a shout out. Um, so dermatoph as I said, dermatophytes and mixed infections um, can comprise three to eleven percent. So and again, it, these these numbers vary worldwide. Non dermatophyte molds. Um, are not a very common cause of onychomycosis, but they do occur. And um, they, they tend to have a specific pattern um, that's very different from the way we see dermatophytes. For example, um, and, I, and I see a fair bit of this, but I, I, again, I have a, a, a population, a practice that's skewed in population because I just see nail problems. But um, with dermatophytes, usually there's toenail fungus. It usually starts as tinea um, on the uh, tinnipedis on the feet, and then it moves into the nail with toenail fungus, and then um, sometimes moves on to the fingernails. Um, there's often a family history and some sort of pre um, predisposition to it, uh, and and it's and it's pretty common actually. Um, whereas non-dermatophyte molds are uncommon and they occur in a different pattern. 
Most of these patients are fingernails only. They don't have any toenail fungus at all, so no dermatophyte anywhere. Um, and these nails are often have been uh, traumatized in the past or have some abnormality that allows this organism, these organisms to attack. Um, the, the five most common ones that we see are fusarium, acrimonium, scopulariopsis, um, aspergillus, and scytolidium. Neoscytolidium, and those are even vary uh, location wise in um, the United States. For example, I see Fusarium far more than my colleagues in, um, in southeastern United States around um, Florida. Um, so, because and because non dermatified molds are a contaminant, it's important to take multiple sam samples for confirmation of a pathologic diagnosis. Um, you know, it, with dermatophytes, you, if you get the answer once, you're, you're pretty you're pretty good. But with molds, you really need to isolate it several different times from the same nail um, to um, to be sure that it is in fact a pathogen and not just a contaminant. Um, yeast and onic yeast onychomycosis is most likely to be caused by Canada species, and there are several um, that are uh, commonly involved. Um, uh, as we talked about before, yeast is most common in fingernails in association with actually patients who have wet work jobs, water exposure, um, tend to get onycholysis and chronic perinicia, and yeast is a component of that, although it's often the, um, the loss of the cuticle or hyponychium, you know, separate from the uh, organism, the yeast comes in afterwards and sets up shop and then, and then really has to be treated to, um, to clear the condition. Um, so let's see here. Um, so non dermatophyte moles, I just want to look, tell, talk a little bit more about that. They tend to be uncommon. Actually, I do see them. In fact, these are the ones that are referred to me by dermatologists who have treated with all the standard treatments for dermatophytes. And, and, and they often are referred, you know, rule out tumor, rule out, um, you know, something entirely different because they think they're not fungal. Um, it's usually a solitary fingernail. Most of my patients are women, actually. There's often a history of trauma. In, uh, in, our, in our case, um, um, Fusarian is the most common, although the one in the middle actually is um, aspergillus as well. And I see aspergillus in the fingernails as well. Um, so, um, so moving down our, um, our little goal diagram of perfect diagnosis, we talked about clinical diagnosis, the patterns of onychomycosis, and the fact that 50% of our problems are fungal. Um, so differential diagnosis is important. We talked about organisms. Now let's talk about diagnostic confirmation. Um, so what are our tools? How do we diagnose? How do we confirm our clinical diagnosis of onychomycosis? Once you think it's onychomycosis, how are you going to prove it? And our tools are the following. And I, I'm going to uh, kind of gloss over this a little bit because um, Dr. Thompson actually is a very much an expert in this area, and he will go through these um, this this uh, in far more detail. Um, but the common tools that we use are KOH and culture, and those have been around for a very long time, um, and and for years have been a gold standard. Although there there probably there are um, certainly newer and and in many cases better, more uh, modern ways of um, diagnosing. Um, uh, onychomycosis in the lab. Um, but they, and, and flow cytometry, I put that on here because that is used um, in research, but not in clinics. So you won't ever be doing that on your patients, at least at this point in time. But just for completion, I added that in. Um, so, so each of these, um, each of these ways of, of diagnosing have pros and cons. And I'll, I'll briefly talk about that. But the very most important thing in getting the correct diagnosis in the lab is getting a good specimen. Generally, more material is better. So clipping the nail and then scraping the nail um, bed in, in the distal subungal um, really will give you a much larger amount of specimen and a much greater um, um, percentage of, of getting the correct diagnosis. So we want to clip away as much of the onycholytic, and this is just for the um, distal subungal, which is 90% anyway, but clip away as much of the, the nail as possible, the onycholytic nail. And you can do this without pain because it's not attached. It's There's air under it, so you can clip that away. And then scrape as, as much of the subungal debris as you can. Um, you want to collect from the most proximal area because that's where the, the viable um, organisms are most likely found. 
And then um, collection, as we said before, is site specific. So with white superficial, you're going to collect it from the surface and proximal, you collect from the proximal. So um, these are the tools that I use, um, the double action nail nipper, which allows me to clip the, the lifted or onycholytic nail, the thickened. I mean, you can clip through thick, thick nails like you're clipping like butter with, with these clippers. And then I take a, a device, um, in this case, a small curette or even sometimes a blade and scrape away the subungual debris. So the nail bed debris, um, which, which I'm doing here with a curette. And then I scrape it onto a slide um, or um, submit it in whatever um, media or um, uh, way uh, vehicle we, we send it in. Um, so um, in this case, I'm scraping it and scraping it on a slide for a KOH. Um, this nail, how would you collect the specimen here? Um, if you take a look at this, it looks like the um, the action, uh, the, the where the active lesions, uh, the active organisms are, is probably most proximal, just a few millimeters away from the, the cuticle. Do you see where it's yellow there? And all of this distal to that, all of the part out toward the free edge from there is lifted. It's onycholysis. So um, you can clip that away painlessly, just with clippers, like the ones I just showed you, and um, and get back to the, um, the place where you're more likely to get a positive. So clip away a lot of that lifted dead nail so that you can take your specimen from an area that's more proximal and your, your yield will be a lot higher and your percentage of getting the right answer will be a lot higher. Um, so let's, let's look at a couple of the, these tests with some pros and cons. Um, KOHs, um, um, I like KOHs. I do a lot of KOHs, actually. Um, um, the results are very quick. I'll get to know that very day what's going on. It's low cost. I mean, the cost is basically my time. KOH is cheap. Um, you need a microscope. But uh, but other than that, it's, it's low cost. Um, the accuracy is very much experience dependent. So if you if you're somebody who doesn't do KOHs more than a few times a year, you're um, the likelihood of you doing a good KOH and getting a good um, specimen and also um, making a diagnosis from a KOH is, is is lower. So I would say if you're going to do this, get a lot of experience and. Um, um, you'll, you'll find that it is a quick and fast way to get an answer. Um, there's some downsides. The viability is uh, you don't have viability. So you can't tell on a KOH if the organisms are dead or alive. You, you don't know if they're viable or not, nor can you identify the organisms. You might get clues, but you really can't um, identify them with certainty. Um, the next, and, and here's a positive KOH. Again, this is looking, I'm not a, not a great, picture looking through my microscope with my iPhone taking a picture but positive KOH you can see the hyphae and and that's that's what they look like um, so um, fungal culture is next fungal culture has been around for a very long time uh, for fungal culture to be effective the, the organisms must be viable so if they're dead they're not going to be growing in the, in the in the media um, the results take up to about three weeks so there is a delay. Um, it's very accurate. If you get an organism, it is it is isolated, and you know that you know what the organism is. So so that um, that is a benefit. Um, you do need viability, and you can identify the organism. So those are two benefits over um, over KOH: the viability and the organism, identi the identification. Um, so um, his the the next sort of newer kid on the block is histopathology of clippings, nail clippings with PAS stain. Um, this gives you the same information, basically, although it's 99% um, 90, predictive value. Um, um, it is a little bit more costly than a, a KOH, um, but much quicker for the clinician to do because you don't have the time of waiting for the KOH to clear the keratin so that you can see the hyphae. Um, there's a, a several day delay. It's not, it's not as long as a culture, but there, you know, there takes some time because these specimens are processed in the lab. They're, um, like a regular histopathology specimen and then, um, uh, stained with, uh, periodic acid shift stain, which uh, which highlights the organisms, the, the fungal organisms. Um, they don't. Uh, it doesn't tell you whether the um, organisms are alive or dead. They can be in the nail and be dead. Um, so viability is similar to KOH. You just don't know, um, and it does not identify the organism. So from that standpoint, it's like a KOH as well. You don't get to know if it is 
trichophyton, mentogryphytes, or candida, whatever you just, you know, uh, it's not, it's not as sensitive. Although you may be able to sort out some of those things. Um, it's, it's, it's definitely not as precise of, um, accuracy in identify, identifying and, and actually um, knowing exactly which organism it is. Um, so uh, PCR, um, and, and actually, let me go back, uh, that is also um, uh, de- uh, sort of, I guess, dependent on experience of, of the person that's reading the slides too. Um, so anyway, let's move on. Uh, PCR, and I'm not really going to talk about this very much at all because um, uh, Dr. Thompson's much more knowledgeable about the um, uh, the background and the uh, mechanisms of all the of um, PCR polymerase chain reaction. Um, so he will he will enlighten us. Um, PCR is fast, actually. You can have that back in forty eight hours. That's great. It's very accurate, extraordinarily accurate, precise, precisely accurate. Um, it may be more expensive, although you know PAS can be up there in cost too. Um, and it does identify the organism with uh, a relative. I mean, with certainty, basically. So um, with that, um, these were our objectives. And I hope that you um, learned why we treat nail fungus and that it's far more than just cosmetic. Um, I hope you understand who gets onychomycosis and who's at more risk for it. Um, Hopefully you can recognize now the types and patterns of onychomycosis and sort out the lookalikes, the differential diagnosis, the ones that look just like fungus but are not. Um, and we hope that you'll be able to confirm your clinical diagnosis with the test that we talked about. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. And um, I, I certainly um, am glad that you joined this session today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Rich, for a fantastic talk and for highlighting the importance of an accurate diagnosis of onychomycosis beyond just cosmetics. So we received a number of questions, which we will get to at the end of all of the presentations. And next up, I would like to introduce you to our second speaker, Dr. Curtis T. Thompson. Dr. Thompson is a board-certified dermatopathologist with expertise in alopecia and diseases of the nail unit. Dr. Thompson is involved in academic research projects and has presented at conferences worldwide. Dr. Thompson currently serves as medical director of CTA Pathology, a leader in digital pathology and PCR diagnostics of onychomycosis. And he is also an affiliate professor of dermatology and pathology at the Oregon Health and Science University. And so with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Thompson for his presentation. All right, thank you, and thank you, Dr. Rich, for that uh, uh, great lecture. I, always, I am I'm a pathologist, not a dermatologist, and uh, so I, I'm always learning uh, the clinical side of nail pathology. I wanted to uh, just say thank you to Dr. Rich. I got into nail uh, pathology uh, a number of years ago because Dr. Rich was based here in Portland, where I am, and we've had a lot of uh, fun and learning over the years uh, collaborating together. What I want to talk, I wanted to say a few words today about specimen submissions beyond the uh, sampling for nail fungus, because as Dr. Rich pointed out, you're often sampling um, uh, dermatitis or another process 50% of the time. And one of the reasons I got into nail pathology is because the specimens, because they have very hard nail and then you're dealing with very delicate matrix and uh, nail bed. Uh, tissue are often very difficult for labs to process, and the slides come out uh, very poor quality, and then the pathologist doesn't feel confident. So I think people shy away from this uh, work, and a lot of my teaching and work has been to uh, make people pathologists more comfortable with this. Um, <clears throat> we've talked a lot about fungus. I'll just... Uh, um, uh, I'll get into this later, but we'll talk about the different types of fungus and what we're seeing in the lab. More words on the culture versus PCR versus the PAS. And then I'll, I'll say a few things about reimbursement uh, for the lab test. So this is a slide I've been showing for many years and uh, says, what can the nail surgeon do to submit a bed or matrix specimen for appropriate interpretation? And uh, I, this is the same slide I've been showing for many years. Generally, we uh, uh, 
you perform a surgery, you perform a biopsy, and you just put it in the container, and then it goes to the lab. And so by by being coming more involved in the orientation and the specimen preservation, we can get a lot better reads and samples. So pre uh, preserving orientation of the tissue, what's proximal, what's distal, providing clear information to the laboratories so they know how to process the sample and know what being looked for. And then uh, uh, one of my goals has been to come up with criteria that's reproducible among different laboratories. So borrowing from the uh, ophthalmologic pathology world, where they have very delicate, thin specimens around eyelids, uh, they uh, place the specimens on pieces of paper and take them to the lab. So we adopted the same um, idea some years ago of taking a cartoon of a nail and uh, then putting the specimens on them. So here's a, a surgery that Dr. Rich did of a pigmented lesion, and you can see that uh, she's reflected the nail. It's obviously pigmented. There's pigment in the plate and then pigmented in the, the, the nail unit epithelium. And here the specimen has uh, come out. It's come out in three pieces, but uh, we're able to Dr. Rich was able to put it precisely on the nail where it came out. And you can print these uh, at my website, or you can even uh, draw a picture of a nail if you don't have it and, and uh, submit it. Uh, it does not matter what kind of paper it is. So you do need these materials from the lab, not necessarily the for inking, this works. Uh, but these are ca tissue cassettes and tissue sponges that we use in histopathology. And you can ask a lab that you're working with to send some over and keep them around. Here's a surgery that Dr. Rich did uh, some years ago. You can see the clinical lesion, longitudinal uh, uh, lesion with a distal, distal hyperkeratosis. Uh, plates removed, and you can see the specimen came out in uh, one piece, and it's inked blue so that you know uh, proximal uh, once it goes through processing. It's often difficult to tell where you are uh, looking through the microscope once it's been processed, especially because almost all the samples we see are abnormal. So by putting it on that uh, cartoon, uh, putting a sponge in it or two sponges to hold it in place and then placing this tissue cassette, closing it, snapping it closed and putting it in a larger bottle, it can come to the lab really nicely preserved. So I encourage you to uh, think about this when you um, uh, sample these. So that's my uh, 10 cents on a uh, nail bed uh, and uh, uh, sampling things uh, beyond the nail plate. And I'll move on to a nicomycosis. So as Dr. Rich said, we're looking primarily for three organisms, the dermatophyte, tinea, the yeast, uh, almost secondarily, generally I believe it is a secondary infection and I'll show you some data supporting that. And then molds, uh, which are important. I won't get into the, um, mold uh, clinical. I think Dr. Rich uh, can say a lot more about that, but I generally tell people if there's a, a, a perinicheal erythema, something that looks more infectious rather than the, the subtypes of the dermatophyte that Dr. Rich showed, then it should be considered. And in the Pacific Northwest where we practice, we do see a significant amount of this. Um, old school diagnosis, this is a a uh, fungal stain that uh, Dr. Andre in uh, Belgium provided me with. And this is uh, what we used to do. We used to um, look for subtle features, oh, subtle features such as the, the, the mold invading the nail plate vertically. So dermatophytes tend to invade uh, laterally. Uh, they're not as aggressive and the, the molds can in invade vertically. That being said, this is almost never ever useful and that's why I'm showing you a slide from another pathologist, not me. You can see that the organisms are larger than dermatophytes, but this is also very subtle. And we have to remember there's there's um, thin and thick variants of, of aspergillus. And so in my pathology training, I was always warned not to try to subtype uh, mold based on what you're seeing through the microscope. That being said, uh, over the years uh, working with Dr. Rich, I think sometimes they put in the comment, I consider that this is our possibility this is a mold because they look larger. And she told me that this was uh, not uncommonly the case. 
So we've already talked about the different uh, old school diagnostic methods. And I will just stop with the potassium hydroxide, as Dr. Rich said. I think it's very, very dependent on the skill of the uh, person doing it. And one of the things that a lot of people don't know about about nail plate is that you have to leave the KOH for a significant amount of time to really be able to see the to see the uh, the the fungus. So a lot of people throw it on and then look at it right away and don't see any. So I think you have to uh, um, maybe even I, I'm not a clinician, but maybe even take the sample when the patient comes in and then let it sit if you're doing it. The histology, which I've been reading almost entirely up until months ago, continue to read, as Dr. Rich said, it ha does have a higher sensitivity, especially than culture, but no species identification is possible. And then comment about culture. Uh, cultures are run for up to six weeks. Uh, we had an experience with a large um, laboratory because we were not a clinical lab at the time. So we sent out cultures. And if we had a specimen come in for PAS and then culture, we would do the PAS. If that was positive, then we would send a remaining sample for culture. And for quite a long period, there was a nice correlation. If we saw the organisms, then we would get a report back weeks later uh, identifying it. And then all of a sudden one day it went negative and every specimen was negative and we were never able to um, uh, interact with the laboratory to try to figure out what happened. And Fortunately, this uh, coincided with PCR starting to become available and we walked away from culture. So point is the culture is very, very uh, uh, dependent on the, the skill of the laboratory uh, performing it. So uh, uh, just moving on to PCR, I wanted to just, uh, I think everyone knows with COVID what PCR is, but um, the machine that we're using, I'll show you some more of the system, it is can also be used for COVID testing. So just know that we're looking for DNA sequences that are specific for uh, the different uh, fungal organisms. Um, the array, which I'll show you more of these arrays, uh, brings in a whole uh, ability to detect many, many organisms because you can, on different spots on an array, you can perform this PCR for um, many different organisms and get a, all the results at one time, all the positive and negatives. So this is just a cartoon of the uh, the Euro array uh, uh, chip that we're using. And the only thing I'll point out here is that it has a lot of control uh, spots on it. So there's spots for orientation. There's spots to verify the specificity of this hybridization. So you have to realize that in this PCR, in DNA sequences, finding the match sequence, it's a hybridization where they're coming together, they're finding their sequence. And this can vary uh, uh, depending on the temperature, the time. And I don't know if you remember in the testing for COVID that was being done for people going into the White House. Uh, last year, um, there it was supposedly a rapid test, incredibly rapid, and then it came out over time that there were um, a lot of false negatives. And um, this is one of the controls we have for this. Well, we're not in a hurry on uh, in in um, fungal nail diagnostics. So, but th there is a control here, and there's also cross contamination control spots uh, uh, present. So the test that we're using uh, detects 23 dermatophytes, three yeasts and three molds specifically, but it also has a universal chip with 50 species of dermatophytes. So there's uh, 27 species tested for that are not specifically identified, but the 23 that are there are the um, uh, usual suspects. Uh, and uh, we do have a few cases where we are seeing the positive uh, dermatophyte detection, but a negative um, uh, species. So we are seeing some of these other 27. There is a small possibility that we wouldn't be detecting that specific and be it could be detected here, but we we don't know. But anyway, it's, it's uh, quite a large test. Um, 
one point here is um, the we can use different uh, sources. So we've been talking about nails. Uh, uh, hair can be used for tinea capitis, and this is useful for uh, epidemic outbreaks uh, of tinea capitis, especially in children. Uh, it's really helping because these outbreaks uh, uh, epidemics can occur in you know neighborhoods and communities and having to rely on culture to figure out what's going on is slow you can take a sample off a of culture and then importantly as for the uh, audience here today skin scales can be uh, uh, done so if you see tinea pedis this is a very good test for this so if you're heading off if you're heading off um, uh, a nicomycosis and just treating the tinea pedis, then this is a good test for that. And then after when we get a regular biopsy or an embedded specimen or for PAS, so if for some reason a specimen goes through, gets processed, embedded in formaldehyde, uh, glass slides made from it, and then we realize it's a fungus, this test is just as sensitive using this formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue uh, to test. So uh, it's as good uh, as it is sampling the nail primarily. So we isolate the DNA different ways depending on what the specimen is. The hybridization occurs, which we uh, mentioned, and then the results are reported. And this is a, a example of the test. We see all of the different species uh, that are tested for, which ones are detected. This is just the positive control. This is that universal spot with 50. Uh, dermatophytes, and then we see trichophyte and rubrum here. Um, oh, and then this is just a point again. Here's the universal spot positive with the 50, and then here we have the specific species there with control spots. This is one from our lab. As you can see now, it's black and white, uh, the way we scanned it. But I, I wanted to show this, the universal detected, but then we saw three different, um, three different, uh, uh, trichophytons and a fusarium mold uh, in this specimen. This isn't typical, and I'll show you some of our co-infection data that we have so far. Just a point about this testing, uh, this is similar to the in situ hybridization or immunohistochemistry, immunoperoxidase that we use in pathology now for decades that we use for diagnosing tumors, finding microorganisms but it's uh, regulated under CLIA. So CLIA is what regulates our lab, not FDA. People always think FDA is, um, uh, or US Food and Drug is what's regulating us, but it's actually the law, the CLIA uh, law that uh, we operate under. So uh, we're allowed to do this and we operate uh, under, by doing internal quality assurance that uh, satisfies our CLIA um, uh, uh, license maintenance. So um, I already showed this. So advantages is Dr. Rich said less than 24 hours and you get the pathogen. Um, it's good for epidemic controls, like I said, with the tinea capitis. And uh, it's uh, one good point is you can uh, know what species you're treating right when it starts. And I'll show you the uh, false positive, false negative data that we internally have been acquiring since we started offering this test on the first of this year. Um, just uh, talking about alternative technologies, there's a laboratory offering qualitative PCR, which tells you the amount, so qualitative amounts, and then next gen sequencing. So just full on, this is what you're always hearing about with COVID, with all the variants, that's what they're doing. They're sequencing this virus. And you can identify the organisms just by uh, full on uh, sequencing the entire um, uh, organism. That's different from what we're doing with PCR, which is using specific probes to, uh, to find smaller areas. So you can find bacteria in this, significance I'm not going to comment on today. The different fungus, uh, so you might, uh, we don't know, maybe we're going to find um, uh, many more organisms that may or may not be pathogenic. That's one of my concerns about this, is when you're uh, doing something in this manner, are you really identifying the pathogenic species, uh, the usual suspects, or are you uh, confusing it? it uh, 
probably it does have an accuracy, and I think it'll be better when we uh, see some testing. I can't find any uh, published studies yet comparing the sensitivity or specificity of this to this array PCR. So that's what we're doing uh, in, uh, in our uh, testing. So just another point, Dr. Rich already drove this home, but sampling is definitely an issue. Uh, you can have the best test, the best molecular test in the world, but if you haven't sampled the area where the uh, pathogen is, you won't get a positive, whether you do a KOH, whether you do a PAS or a culture, or whether you do it uh, with a molecular PCR test. And what we do in our lab is we provide requisitions that have a Ziploc bag. And the point, the, the, the goal here is, is to stop clinicians from putting the sample into a bottle with formaldehyde. So we can still run these if they're put in formaldehyde, but as Dr. Rich showed you, the the, the debris, the subungal debris, removing the nicolytic plate and then sampling with the curatage, the debris, that's really where the money is. So this uh, Ziploc, which we uh, staple onto every single requisition, the purpose of that is to uh, uh, get a better sample and not lose this debris. If you put this debris into a liquid, it'll dissolve away and it can't uh, be retrieved unless you centrifuge it. Um, I won't go into the specifics of how to uh, sample. I think Dr. Rich talked about it, but just a point of subungal debris, very, very important. And then we already talked about this. You can use a number of different samples and uh, keep in mind scraping of skin is not bad. So we uh, have been running, a, we ran a PAS versus PCR uh, study uh, for several months after starting this and collected 82 samples in which both PCR and PAS uh, were identified. The PCR identified um, uh, was positive in 73% of the specimens, which is the high end of the data that Dr. Rich uh, uh, showed uh, for the uh, for the dermatophytes, and the PAS only identified it in 59%. And I got to say, I was surprised at this. I uh, just in my uh, working in this world assumed that PAS was still going to be right up there and good, and the limitation was going to be that we couldn't tell what the organism is. But it's not true. The PCR is significantly better, and we actually had 12 samples out of this that were negative by PAS but positive by PCR, and we had one sample that was positive by PCR but not uh, positive by uh, I'm sorry positive by PAS staining not positive by PCR. I don't think this uh, justifies continuing to do PAS. So the conclusion of this initial study, sensitivity, the true positive rate is 15% superior to PAS stain only. It uh, is Dr. Rich, and I'll show you some uh, data on the, the uh, cost of this, but we think of PAS as a cheaper stain than a molecular stain, but the problem is, is you're using a pathologist at a microscope to read this, and this is a, an expensive step in the testing, whereas PCR is automated and doesn't require a pathologist running each uh, test individually. So I believe these results justify stopping the use of PAS as the primary diagnostic uh, tool based on sensitivity alone. So we're not talking about price, we're not talking about anything, but this 15% superior, I, I think, is important. So if you're going to go all the way to um, diagnose the patient, confirm what's there, I think uh, it's justified uh, to switch to the PCR. As we said, you get the, uh, the species uh, mold dermatophyte identification. I already uh, <laughs> told you uh, my thoughts about culture. I don't believe it should be done anymore unless it's a very specific case where the PCR isn't um, um, uh, helping or you know a treatment resistant. So there might be a remote need for it, but not not significant. So we've since been running the PCR study, and we came right uh, here. We are seeing 88% of our cases are dermatophytes. Dr. Rich said 50 to 72 percent. Uh, I know that she's pulling out uh, mixed infections, and uh, but we do see dermatophytes in 88 percent. Yeast coming in at 
9%, which Dr. Rich cited 10% from Dr. Gupta. I mean, I'm sorry, yeast, uh, she uh, had a 19%, I'm, I'm sorry. The mold is was at 10%. So mold was 10%, we're getting 13, and we're getting the yeast and 9% of them. 8% of these cases have a dual infection, which I'll show you uh, some of the uh, data on that. So you can see here, these are all the organisms with the mixed infections. Uh, we can see uh, different types of yeast. Uh, and the most common is the trichophyton with a mold or trichophyton with a yeast. And uh, so we see yeast co-infection. So we had eight cases out of this 147 that had a dual infection. 50% of them were with candida parasol Solosis. So I think I concur with Dr. Rich that probably you get the initial uh, 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 dermatophyte or the mold, and then you get the, the candida showing up as a secondary infection. Uh, we had a two molds in a yeast, which could also be the same uh, scenario. I mean, with the dermatophyte, where you have the mold showing up after the dermatophyte, and two of the molds with the yeast, which may be the, the secondary infection of the mold infection with the yeast. We don't know. And then uh, just the one case I showed you had dual dermatophytes. So by and large, we're not seeing different species of uh, dermatophytes. Uh, it's generally just one. So a comment about reimbursement, this was touched on, and I just wanted to show you, this is our experience so far. So this is what's being paid for by insurance. And so the, to run a complete, uh, the payment, the insurance, this is insurance payment. Insurance payment for a complete run uh, on PCR is uh, uh, on average $520. You see these lower numbers here, but there's multiple uh, units. It's a, the arm wonderful medical billing world. So that is our average reimbursement. So as Dr. Rich said, PAS alone is not insignificant. So you're coming in at $274 for PAS. And like I pointed out, this is not a cheap test because one, it's difficult for the lab to get nailed to stick to a glass slide until you're using pathologist's time. And this is before you've done the culture. So if you have to go back into a culture, uh, for whatever reason, then by then you've surpassed the the price of the PCR. So um, these are the these are the numbers to think of in your in your head. Uh, um, uh, PAS culture more expensive than PCR. PAS alone is about um, sixty percent of the price of the PCR. So our experience to date. Um, the PCR works very well after PAS. Like I said, if we get a biopsy for something else and then decide we want to do the PCR because we see fungus in the biopsy, then it works very, very well. Um, the, the PCR is definitely quite a bit better than the PAS uh, for just sensitivity alone. Co-infection is, is common. Eight of the, eight of the uh, 99 cases had, had a co-infection, and we are uh, successfully getting paid by insurances. So the PCR, Dr. Rich said it's fast. We get it in uh, 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 one day. Uh, simple because the pathologist is not involved. It's a clinical lab test. Quite a bit of high, higher sensitivity and specificity. And I think that the uh, test can be modified as we uh, go over time to be more uh, specific. One comment about the test we're doing is Dr. Rich showed that uh, aspergillus is a pathogen and it is not tested for in the um, array that we're using. The reason being is aspergillus is ubiquitous in the environment, the aspergillus niger black mold, you know, you always hear about it in people's houses. It, um, it contaminates the test. So there's, there's an issue with uh, diagnosing it, even though we know it's a pa uh, pathogen. So that's one thing that has to be um, thought about. Uh, we did at one point uh, put out old, old school Petri dishes in our laboratory and in a hospital I was working with, and they all grew uh, uh, Aspergillus niger. So it really is ubiquitous in our environment, especially in the winter. So thank you very much. Uh, this is my email if you have any questions. I wanted to show you, this is a really neat uh, 
thumb sculpture. They, unfortunately, this artist, Cesar Baldaccini, French uh, artist, did thumbs, not um, toes. He calls it La Pousse, which is French for thumb. This is in the Louisiana Museum in um, Copenhagen, Denmark. If you ever go there, this is the one thing, you, in my opinion, you should see in uh, Copenhagen. And uh, this one's about six feet tall. This one, you can see the cars, is on one of the auto um, streets in uh, Marseille, France. And so he, he did a lot of these. Thank you very much. and. Uh, pass this on. Thank you, Dr. Thompson, for a great talk and for introducing us to the workflow and advantages of molecular detection for nail fungal diseases. Uh, so we've received quite a few questions in the chat, but we'll be answering those after our final speaker. So next up, we will hear from Dr. Aya el -Hajj. Dr. el -Hajj holds a Doctor of Pharmacy degree with dual pharmacist licensure in California and New York. Dr. El Haj also received her executive MBA and is currently the scientific affairs manager at Euroimmune US, where she is actively involved in strategy planning, business development, and building alliances with key opinion leaders in the industry. And so with that, I will hand it over to Dr. El Haj. Okay, thank you for the great introduction. I'm excited to be speaking with you all today about this topic. Uh, so as Dr. Heckler uh, mentioned, I'm currently the Scientific Affairs Manager here at Euromune US. Uh, this webinar and any use of brand names is strictly for educational purposes. So earlier on in the webinar, Dr. Phoebe Rich discussed the varying clinical presentations in nail fungal infections and Dr. Thompson uh, just highlighted the importance of early diagnosis and particularly the key differences between PCR and culture. So today I'll be discussing a bit more about the consequences of misdiagnosis and mistreatment, as well as why species specific treatment is important for these fungal infections. And then finally, I'll close on uh, some in information on a couple of pipeline products in your immune's portfolio and the impact this testing can have on practice. So this slide shows some of the common forms of tinea that we've uh, previously discussed. As you can see by some of these images, the clinical presentation varies. And although the causative organisms may differ, there is quite a bit of overlap in the species, mainly the trigophyton, microsporum, and epidermophytons. So the prevalent dermatophytic infections include tinea capitis, which is also known as the scalp ringworm, uh, which is commonly caused by T. tonsorans or M. canis, while uh, tinea unguium, commonly referred to as onychomycosis, which uh, Dr. Rich mentioned affects mainly the nails, uh, caused by T. rubrum and T. interdigitale. Uh, and then as we know, tinea pedis, which is uh, known as athlete's foot, is most commonly caused by T. rubrum and T. mintagraphytes. Uh, in the US alone, there are more than 3 million cases of tinea infections every year. So knowing what species a patient is infected with can make a big difference when it comes to treatment selection. Okay, and since the clinical presentation may appear more generalized, there is a big possibility of misdiagnosis, especially when a, a, diag a diagnosis is made based on visual appearance. So if an infection goes unrecognized or untreated or even mistreated, it can lead to potential spread to other people in close communities, which is the most common mode of transmission, secondary infections, or permanent damage and spread. Uh, it particularly affects immunocompromised patients, obese individuals, uh, patients with impaired circulation or poor hygiene, which we'll get into a little later. So this paper by Westerberg and Voyak shows that diagnosing just by a physical exam can be uh, inaccurate. So this is where alternate forms of testing come into play. PCR can be used as a complement test to cultures and other testing and is shown to be more accurate than cultures in this uh, study. So on the right side table, you see the commonly prescribed medications like cyclosporox or the azoles, fluconazole, and more recently, itraconazole, as well as terbinafine. So two things I want to point your attention to here. Uh, the duration of treatment can range from a couple of weeks to 12 months. So that's why early diagnosis is crucial. We don't want a patient to be on a medication for an extended period of time, especially when it can lead to adverse events like nausea and vomiting, electrolyte imbalances, headaches, and so on. Additionally, uh, the tinea pedis and corporis, for example, are typically treated topically unless the infection is more extensive or severe, while uh, tinea capitis and unguium are best treated with oral antifungal agents. 
uh, since the topical agents can't penetrate the hair shaft uh, as efficiently. Again, this depends on from patient to patient, but uh, if the clinical presentation is not clear, doing a PCR test can provide support in accurately diagnosing a patient in a shorter period of time. So a question that comes up often is, okay, so what? We do the PCR test, find the fungal pathogen, but that, does that really change what treatment we go with? And uh, the answer is yes, it can. So our dermatomycosis panel, which Dr. Thompson mentioned, can detect over uh, you know, the 50 different fungal pathogens, two of which are MCANIS and T. mentagraphites, which are fairly prevalent. So this study by Sante et al. showed that microscopy was less sensitive than cultures, and cultures had equivalent sensitivities to PCR. Additionally, um, you know, as I mentioned, early detection can lead to early treatment. So the azole antifungals, which are used in both species types um, typically, but what's interesting in this study, they found that itraconazole had better responses such as reducing lesions and redness in MCANIS compared to team integrophytes. So using this test, if you were to detect MCANIS, then you would say itraconazole might be a better uh, antifungal agent to use. So in addition to possible treatment, of course, it's important to consider non-pharmacological therapies, you know, good skin, skin hygiene, wearing proper socks and shoes, clean bedding and hats and so on. And just going into the uh, treatment options here. So here is a breakdown of primary and alternative treatment options for t tonsorans and MCANIS on the top and then Fusarium on the bottom. So in the top boxes, I want to point your attention to the durations, which can range from two to, two to 12 weeks, you know, depending on which therapeutic agent is chosen. And of course, based on if the patient is susceptible or resistant to these agents. So as a pharmacist, I've had patients who say that, you know, taking a medication for four weeks is difficult because of their work schedules or forgetfulness and so on. So this could really decrease the adherence in some patients. And if it is a misdiagnosis, this will prolong the time to getting their actually necessary treatment. And then on the bottom with the Fusarium, particularly F. solani and F. oxysporum, which are the most common ones seen in this species, these groups are often resistant to most antifungal agents and could be fatal if the patient is immunocompromised. Again, this just highlights the importance that early detection uh, could aid in proper treatment and management. And then finally, I wanted to point out some interactions and toxicities that could arise. Like with most medications, the use of these antifungal agents is not without side effects or drug interactions. So there's three patient populations in particular, the transplant patients, HIV AIDS, and cancer patients that are at the highest, highest risk of developing fungal diseases. So if we take HIV AIDS as an example, a patient might be on Truvada for prevention of HIV exposure or one of these once a day complete regimens like Atripla, Stribild, and so on. So pairing these common HIV drugs with some of the common antifungal agents, like we previously mentioned, terbinafine or the azoles, it is crucial to check for interactions and toxicities. For example, uh, which you'll see on the right here, if a patient is on fluconazole and they're also taking atripla, they're at a higher risk of QT prolongation. So let's say this patient already has AFib or an underlying cardiac condition, it would be beneficial to have the patient on a different antifungal agent or on that agent for as little time as possible. Same thing here with the SIP inhibitors, which could decrease the effectiveness of their medication and also impact their liver function. So overall, the healthcare team should work in collaboration to confirm the diagnosis and effectively manage the infection with both pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic agents. Okay, and a question that we get asked quite a bit is about uh, candida. Uh, so candida is a part of the normal body flora, but is also a common cause of yeast infection. So when the normal flora is disturbed, this could lead to an acute infection. Uh, C. albicans is the most frequent causative agent, but more recently the NAC species um, have been emerging. So the NAC species include uh, Parapsilosis, Tropicalis, Crusae, and Glabrata. And uh, common areas of infection include the mouth and genital regions, but uh, other regions, skin and nails could also be affected. And therefore, differential diagnosis, for example, with other tinea infections uh, may be warranted. And uh, Dr. Thompson previously mentioned that 50% of the mixed infections had uh, the C. parapsilosis in it. So being able to detect a particular candida species is truly imperative. 
And this is what led to the R&D focus in creating a panel specifically for candidiasis called the Euroarray candidiasis, which can detect many candida species in, in a single reaction. Uh, and the NAC species as well as the albicans and others are included. And this could be particularly useful in patients who are more prone to acute infections such as diabetics, obese patients, patients on immunosuppressants, antibiotics, corticosteroids, and so on. And uh, finally, I wanted to close off with this quote by uh, Lung et al., which really drives this discussion home. Uh, it emphasizes the fact that misdiagnosis could lead to unnecessary treatment, which could expose the patient to side effects and drug interactions. So thank you, everyone, for your time and attention today. I will hand it to Dr. Venkat to begin the Q&A panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. El Haj, for this very insightful presentation, especially showing that species-specific identification of such nail fungal infections is very crucial in order to, you know, for the clinicians to be able to prescribe the right kind of treatment. So with that, uh, we come to the Q&A panel of our discussion. I encourage our speakers, Dr. Phoebe Rich, as well as Dr. Thompson, to um, come back on their camera as well as audio so that they can you know, address the questions together with me. Perfect. All right, so uh, the first question is, how to distinguish between candida and trichophyton species clinically? How would you treat resistant onychomycosis? Ah, okay. Um, so I guess, I guess part of it depends on, uh, um, oh, uh, the disease, um, the disease itself that you're looking at, in other words, is it skin? Is it nail? Is it <clears throat> um, intertriginous areas? Canada likes certain areas of the body, um, whereas, um, the, and many of those are places that we would not necessarily see a dermatophyte. Um, so location is a, is a big uh, distinguishing factor. Um, I would say most, uh, well, uh, dermatophytes are the most common uh, thing, uh, organism to affect the skin, hair, and nails, basically, and yeast, not a very common um, uh, invader of those structures. And when yeast is present, it's often as a secondary invader or a second, so it's there because of the other infection, not causing the infection itself. So I'd say it's secondary. All right. Thank you. So I'm just going to oscillate the between the questions a little bit so that all the speakers are able to address the questions. So this one is probably for Dr. Thompson. Uh, for the PAS versus PCR study, did you test PCR with the FFPE materials or fresh samples? Yeah, we uh, the initial uh, study of 82 specimens was all uh, formal and fixed. So we formal and fixed it, and then we did both the PAS and the PCR. And then since uh, we closed that and stopped the, we, uh, we've we only been doing the PCR and it's it's on both types of specimens, but um, we, uh, we saw a good correlation between the two. Okay, thank you. Yeah. The next question is what is important for the doctor in the diagnosis of uh, onychomycosis, preparation or breeding? Preparation or? It says it said breeding. breeding. That doesn't, yeah, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. I don't know what breeding is. I thought is, it was a technical term, um, diagnosis. I think it's, um, as, as Dr. Thompson stressed, I think what's very important in getting an accurate diagnosis is specimen collection. Um, and Curtis went over that very well. I don't know if there are any highlights that you want to say or talk about Curtis, but um, I think that's the most important thing, a clinical diagnosis and then confirming it um, with the laboratory PCR and, and getting the correct specimen for that. Okay. Yeah. And submitting it dry, I think is really important. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So then this one, I think I would leave it to, again, all of you. Um, so how do you choose your testing options? Um, would you have like a diagnostic algorithm that you would like to recommend uh, between the KOH staining plus PCR, or would it be preferable to directly go to the PCR? Um, I, th I think if PCR is available, PCR is definitely the way to go directly. Um, if, you wanna, if you want an instant, by instant, I mean, you know, within 45-minute answer, you could do a KOH too, but I would still confirm it with PCR because with 
KOH, you don't get an organism identification, and that's important. We have um, uh, some uh, clients that still want to do the PCR because of the price difference, and I initially thought, okay, we could have an algorithm of P, you know, hold the P PCR off until we have a positive PAS. But seeing that 15% sensitivity difference between the PAS and the PCR to me is significant enough to to say that I don't I don't think we need an algorithm for that. I think we just need to do the PCR. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. So the next question: How often do you observe? multiple fungal infections in a single sample? Well, we, we had this set, we have the set of 147 specimens. I think 99 had an identifiable fungus of some type and eight of those. So it was like 8% about, we're just gathering this data is hot off the press. 8% had the co-infection and then 4% uh, were the candida species. Okay, thank you. So then the next question, what are the recommendations for clinicians who are diagnosing by vis visual inspection? And is there a higher rate of misdiagnosis just by uh, visually inspecting? Uh, yes, I, I think it is very important to confirm your clinical diagnosis because some of the time it will be wrong. And you um, as was beautifully stated, you don't want to treat the wrong thing with uh, with antifungals that could actually cause side effects and and have negative outcomes. So, thank you. Um, so then, since there was a treatment related part, which Dr. Rich addressed, I'll jump to a treatment question. What drugs are most effective in treatment of uh, onychomycosis? Is surgery required? Uh, so the second part of it, onychomycosis, I believe, is a medical condition, not a surgical condition. Uh, there are a few situations where surgery may be appropriate. Certainly, if somebody has onychomycosis on all of their toenails, you do not want to remove 10 toenails. Um, but if it's a solitary digit that is slow to respond or not responding to medical therapy, then rarely, but sometimes um, uh, avulsion of the nail and treatment after that. Um, is, is appropriate, but, but that's not something we do very often. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then a um, couple of culture related questions. Uh, is there a best media for fungal culture or is there a need to use a more different type of media? We haven't been sending cultures for three years maybe. So, <laughs> and my recommendation is not to do it. But I don't know, do you still do it in certain cases, Phoebe? Not very often. Not it's, very often, yeah. Not very often, yeah. Hardly, needs, hardly at all, I think it's really. Time to walk away from that, <laughs> in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. On a similar note, if performing culture, is it critical to, uh, is it critical to speciate, meaning I think identify the organism? Example, knowing that a trichophyton has been detected, is it important to know if it is a mentographite or any other species as well. Well, it's always nice to know. I think more information you can have, the better. However, uh, most dermatophytes do respond to the same or similar um, and uh, treatments, antifungal treatments. So, um, you know, terbenafin or itraconazole can be used on most dermatophytes, I would say. Um, if you are dealing with uh, tinea capitis, you, you definitely want to know what the organism is. So, yeah, I, th I think I think you want to know basically. All right. Um, okay. Then a couple of uh, technical questions on the PCR. So, uh, how do you process or prepare the nail sample for PCR testing? Um, you, yeah, Dr. El Haj may know more about this than I do because we've learned it from you. But the big point was our laboratory runs different. Uh, uh, isolation protocols for the different specimens. So if it's coming from formaldehyde, it's different than if it's a uh, uh, unfixed nail. So they they just follow those uh, those protocols. Uh, and there was a question about 
was the was the DNA isolation separate from the PCR? And that's yes, it is. We didn't get into the details of that, but it's a it's a separate step. Okay, so then um, is it required to do a nail culture in order to do a PCR? No, not at all. We're no, <laughs> no more cultures. <laughs> Okay. There was a question about the mass spectrometry, spectrometry, and I try to go to updates on microbiology, you know, uh, uh, technology when I see them at meetings. And I really believe it's going to move toward what we're doing, array, array PCR and maybe next gen sequencing. But I do believe the problem with next gen sequencing, maybe it's too sensitive. You're going to be sequencing things from the, that may not be a pathogen. All right, thank you. Um, the next question will be uh, in terms of treatment. How long uh, does the treatment for onychomycosis take? Is it just empirical treatment? Uh, no, the, we, we'd like to not have it be empirical because sometimes our clinical impression is, is not accurate. So we, we definitely need to confirm it. Um, and, uh, you know, it, the how long does it take is, is sort of a two prong answer because um, we treat with the drug, the medication, usually for several months. And then the drug in terbenafin's case, for example, stays in the nail for about nine months after we stop treatment. What really determines how quickly the nail gets better is how quickly the nail grows. And because uh, toenails take about a year to completely grow out and fingernails six months, um, you know, it's time the, the time for clearing is different than the time for treating. Uh, we, and, we do sometimes do both boosters and topicals along with the oral, but I'm, I'm speaking particularly about oral. Right. And Dr. Rich, just to add to that, I know we, you know, empirical treatment is not really the route that most physicians take, mainly because of the growing, you know, drug resistance, especially with antibiotics and antifungal agents. So that's why, you know, PCR really helps, you know, once we accurately detect, we can accurately treat and hopefully get to a, you know, a like sufficient treatment and a sufficient like overall management plan for the patient. Okay. So then uh, the next question is uh, probably Dr. Thompson, based off your study, do you have any data which shows a uh, correlation between PCR uh, and culture? No, we haven't done culture in three years and we never, I just gave you my not in a study experience of there was a correlation when the lab with one laboratory that then totally fell apart. So, but we, that's when we switched to PCR. I can take like one more question since we are almost towards the end of our webinar. So um, does the Euroimmune microarray record CT values? Probably Dr. Thompson or Elhad. Yes, I don't believe that it does actually. Um, it's really, it's a very simplified test where it just tells you, you know, whether it does detect or the fungal pathogen or not. Um, this isn't something that our instrument does because it's not a real-time PCR test. I think we are nearby or very close to the end of our webinar, but I just wanted to give the speakers an opportunity to um, say a couple of sentences or any last uh, feedbacks or comments regarding uh, reliable and accurate diagnosis of nail fungal infections. Yeah, I just want to reiterate that it's very important to have the correct diagnosis the correct clinical diagnosis and then confirmed by laboratory diagnosis in the most specific ways with PCR. Yeah, just thank you for the opportunity to speak today. And I got to say, I'm thrilled that we've made this jump into uh, PCR diagnostics. I think it's a real step forward for uh, uh, a nicomycosis and other nail uh, uh, fungal treatment diseases. Yeah, just to reiterate, uh, Dr. Rich, Dr. Thompson, uh, thank you again for the opportunity. And, uh, you know, it's exciting to see how this, you know, this area will change in the future. All right. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Rich, Dr. Thompson, and Dr. El Haj. I think this was a very insightful and informative session. I think the participants would also agree. And there were a lot of additional questions, uh, which will be communicated back to you via email. We'll forward these questions to the speakers individually.
So with that, uh, one last uh, comment before I close this webinar. This webinar um, is offering free PACE credits. So those of you who wish to obtain your educational credits, uh, once the webinar closes, you'll be directed to a page where you can follow the instructions to obtain uh, free PACE credits. So the next webinar that we would be hosting will also be in the field of derm dermatology. It is in the field of autoimmune dermatology. Uh, Dr. Sinha, as well as Dr. Grover, will be talking a little bit more about autoimmune markers, or specifically biomarkers for detection of autoimmune uh, blistering skin diseases. So this webinar will be uh, hosted on uh, July 29th, and uh, we'll be sending out invitations shortly. So until then, thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See ya. Bye.